Let's now talk about some of the blood-related disorders, beginning with the red blood cells. Anytime we have elevated numbers of red blood cells where we have a high hematocrit, that is referred to as erythrocytosis. However, if we have low levels or low concentrations of circulating red blood cells, then that's referred to as anemia. While with the leukocytes, if we have elevated or higher concentrations of white blood cells in circulation, then that's referred to as leukocytosis. If, however, the concentrations are really high or really elevated, then that's referred to as leukemia. On the flip side, if we have low numbers of circulating leukocytes, then that's referred to as leukopenia. With leukocytosis, incidentally, this is not uncommon if we have an infection, such as a urinary tract infection where the number of leukocytes will increase. With leukemia, however, this is cancer. With platelets, if we have elevated numbers of circulating platelets, it's referred to as thrombocytosis. And if we have low numbers of platelets in circulation, then that's referred to as thrombocytopenia. Let's look at this table. And what I've done is highlighted the disorders that I would like to focus on, beginning with primary cytosis which is, again, elevated numbers of circulating red blood cells. And some of the symptoms of urethrocytosis is the spleen will be rather large, blood viscosity increases because of the increased hematocrit, blood volume also increases, and unfortunately there is some potential of clogging of the capillaries and as well as high blood pressure or hypertension. With anemia, where we have low numbers of circulating red blood cells, depending upon the deficiency or the condition is what gives the anemia its name. For example, if your intake of iron is low, then you're referred to as having iron deficiency anemia. And of course, we know the importance of iron. Folate deficiency anemia is you are not adequately taking enough food sources that are high in folic acid. And folic acid is absolutely necessary for DNA replication, which occurs just before the cell begins to divide. Pernicious anemia is when you are vitamin B12 deficient. What I've done is made a diagram on the left, and assuming you are eating a high protein diet, especially animal sources of protein, will be high in vitamin B12. When it reaches the stomach, our stomach is very acidic. And the idea is this acid will break off the vitamin B12. Intrinsic factor is produced by the stomach. This is the only way we can absorb vitamin B12 is if it binds to intrinsic factor. Because together, they will be absorbed in the small intestines. So if our stomach is unable to produce intrinsic factor, then we will not have the ability to absorb this vitamin. And vitamin B12 is also necessary for DNA synthesis, which again happens before cell division. Then we have hemorrhagic anemia. So we are losing blood either due to trauma or a bleeding ulcer or when a woman is experiencing excessive menstrual flow. Then we have hemolytic anemia, where the red blood cells are rather delicate and they begin to lyse or they rupture. So it could be due to some type of inherited defect, exposure to certain drugs, snake venom, for example, and autoimmune diseases, as well as hemolytic disease of the newborn, which we'll talk about at the end of this presentation. While aplastic anemia, where the red bone marrow is unable to undergo erythropoiesis. So this could be due to damage to the stem cells and as well as certain drugs, chemicals, and radiation. Drugs, for example, related to chemotherapy. We've already talked about leukemia and thrombocytopenia. Leukemia, again, is cancer where you have abnormally high levels of circulating red blood cells, while thrombocytopenia, where you have low numbers of circulating platelets. Clotting disorders include von Willebrand disease, where the person is unable to produce the von Willebrand factor. 
We know the importance of the von Willebrand factor in that it's what allows the platelets to adhere and potentially activate the circulating platelets. And we need to form the platelet plug before we can form a normal blood clot. Hemophilia is where the individual is lacking certain clotting factors, which we'll soon discuss. While infectious disease of the blood, septicemia, sometimes referred to as blood poisoning, where the growth of microorganisms is so high that it begins to circulate in our blood. In addition, some of these microorganisms will release toxins, which makes this potentially life-threatening. So this could be due to septic shock, for example. It could also be insertion of an intravenous tube or any type of medical device that perhaps was not adequately sterilized. What makes septicemia potentially life-threatening is there is a dramatic drop or decrease in the blood pressure. I'd like to focus on one particular blood disorder, and that is sickle cell anemia, also referred to as sickle cell disease. Before we go into the details, what I'd like to do is give you a brief review of some genetics, and we begin with the capital S, which stands for the normal allele, and the little s, which stands for the sickled allele. So this is classic Mendelian genetics, whereby if the individual has two large s's or two uppercase s's, then they are defined as being homozygous dominant. That an individual will not have this particular disease. If you are a heterozygote, then you have the dominant allele and the recessive allele, whereby some of the red blood cells will sickle, but the symptoms of the disease is very mild to the point the person may not even know they are carrying the sickled allele. If, however, you are homozygous recessive, where both the alleles are little less, then you have sickle cell anemia. So what has happened? What has caused this mutation? It boils down to the beta chains. So we know that hemoglobin A has two beta chains and two alpha chains. With someone who has sickle cell anemia or is a heterozygote, the beta chains of their hemoglobin will have one amino acid difference or substitution from that of someone who has hemoglobin A, the normal adult hemoglobin. We can see this when we look at this image right here. So at position number six, instead of glutamic acid, which is a hydrophilic amino acid, it's been substituted with valine, which is quite hydrophobic. This is enough to cause the red blood cell to sickle. Unlike the normally shaped red blood cell, a sickled red blood cell is stiff and it's rigid, causing it to get stuck in some of the smallest blood vessels, such as capillaries. And because of this, the tissue cells downstream will not get adequate amounts of oxygen, which makes this disease quite painful. Furthermore, sickle cell disease causes these red blood cells to lyse, leading to hemolytic anemia. Someone who is a heterozygote is actually immune from malaria. They cannot contract malaria. So with sickle cell, this hemoglobin S can be found in countries around the equator, such as some African countries. Hence, the prevalence among African Americans to have or to be carriers of the sickle cell allele. Let's talk about a few disorders involving hemostasis. The first one are thromboembolytic disorders, disorders from an embolus when a piece of thrombus breaks off, and bleeding disorders where we are unable to form a normal blood clot. We'll begin with thromboembolytic disorders. What is a thrombus? A thrombus is a blood clot that develops in a blood vessel or a chamber of the heart. So right here is a thrombus, and should a piece of this thrombus breaks off, then now we refer to that as an embolus. So you can think of an embolus as a circulating thrombus. But not all emboli 
are from a thrombus. It could be a piece of fat. It could also be an air bubble or a plaque from atherosclerosis. Whatever the case may be, this potentially is life-threatening because depending upon the size of the circulating embolus, it potentially can obstruct a blood vessel. And if that occurs, then that results in occlusion, preventing any blood from reaching our tissues and our organs. And because these tissues are deprived of oxygen, then they will eventually die. And that's referred to as an infarct. We have two examples of a thromboembolytic disorder. The first one is a pulmonary embolism. And most pulmonary embolism results from a deep vein thrombosis. So a blood clot develops in one of the veins in our lower limbs, and should a piece of that break off, it will then travel through the venous system, eventually making its way into the inferior vena cava, which then reaches the right side of the heart. It will then flow to our lungs through the pulmonary arteries. Therefore, that embolus can now block one of the blood vessels that we find in our lungs, resulting in pulmonary embolism. Another type of example is a cerebral embolism. Now, this can occur from atrial fibrillation. So with atrial fibrillation, since the atria is fibrillating and is not contracting, not all the blood in both the right and left atria will be ejected into their respective ventricles. As a result, blood now pools in both atria. And as I said before, we should never have blood pooling or remain stagnant. And as a consequence, that blood will now become a blood clot. And if a piece of it breaks off in the left atrium, blood then is ejected into the left ventricle, up the aorta, and a branch off of that aorta is the common carotid artery, one of the major blood supplies to our head, including the brain. From the common carotid artery, we have the internal carotid artery, one of the major arteries that delivers blood to our brain. And once it reaches the brain, it potentially can then get stuck in one of the smaller cerebral arteries. We now have a cerebral embolism commonly known as a stroke. So the risk factors will be atherosclerosis, it could be inflammation, when the blood flows very slowly, or when blood does not flow at all due to immobility. An example, of course, is deep vein thrombosis. Please remember, anytime there is injury to the blood vessel, there is a potential of forming a thrombus or a blood clot. Therefore, when an individual undergoes surgery, it's a given that there will be injury to the blood vessel. So in order to prevent blood clots from forming, it's important that after the surgery, the patient is moved or the patient is forced to move. That way, preventing blood from stagnating or preventing blood stasis. We have anticoagulant drugs that will prevent undesirable clotting. Aspirin is a good example. And why aspirin is referred to as an anticoagulant drug is because it inhibits thromboxanes. And thromboxanes are released by activated platelets. Thromboxanes are vasoconstrictors and also they promote platelet adhesion and aggregation. Heparin released by basophils and mast cells. That can also be given, especially if the person has undergone a medical procedure, such as open heart surgery, bypass surgery, uh, kidney dialysis, blood transfusion. Another anticoagulant drug is warfarin, also known as Coumadin. And what makes this an anticoagulant drug is it interferes with the action of vitamin K. We discussed the importance of vitamin K because it's needed to make a number of these clotting factors. The Bagatran or Pradaxa directly inhibits thrombin. And without thrombin, we cannot activate fibrinogen to fibrin. And it's a class of anticoagulant drugs that are known as direct thrombin inhibitors. Taken all together, they're referred to as blood thinners. But keep in mind, they are not thinning the blood per se. They're just preventing the formation of a blood clot. Do these anticoagulant drugs dissolve an existing blood clot? 
No, they do not. That's where tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, and urokinase comes in. The second major type of disorder involving hemostasis are bleeding disorders. Thrombocytopenia is a deficient number of circulating platelets. So we have less than 50,000 platelets per microliter of blood, when normally we should have platelets numbering in the hundreds of thousands per microliter of blood. Causes include disorder of the red bone marrow, as in the case with leukemia, suppression or destruction of the red bone marrow, which can result from radiation and as well as certain drugs. Petechia is a classic symptom of thrombocytopenia, where we have these reddish or purple spots, which represents localized blood loss or localized hemorrhage that appears in the skin and mucous membranes. Treatment is transfusion of platelets. The second major bleeding disorder involves our liver. We know that the liver synthesizes a number of plasma proteins, including coagulants or clotting factors. So if the liver is diseased or isn't working too well, in the case of hepatitis or cirrhosis of the liver, then the liver is unable to produce or synthesize these clotting factors or procoagulants. And without these clotting factors, then we will not be able to control blood loss or we're just not going to form a blood clot. Furthermore, the liver produces bile, and bile is important for the absorption of fat. Now, vitamin K is a lipid-soluble vitamin. Vitamin K is produced by the bacteria found in our intestines. For us to absorb this lipid-soluble, hydrophobic vitamin, we need bile. Another bleeding disorder is hemophilia. It is an inherited condition. The defective allele is found on the X chromosome, so it's said to be sex-linked. And with hemophilia, there's a specific type of clotting factor that is lacking or deficient. So in the case of hemophilia A, which happens to be the most common, 77% of hemophilia patients have hemophilia A. The clotting factor that's missing or deficient is factor 8, also known as anti-hemophilic factor A. The next type of hemophilia is hemophilia B, also known as the Christmas disease. So for individuals with this type of hemophilia, they're missing factor 9, also known as the Christmas factor. The last type of hemophilia is the milder one. So hemophilia C is milder than hemophilia A and B. What's lacking or deficient is factor 11, also known as plasma thromboplastin antecedent, PTA. The symptom includes prolonged bleeding because they cannot form a blood clot without these clotting factors, and the blood begins to accumulate in the joint cavities. The treatment will involve injections of genetically engineered clotting factors. Before this came about, the individual had to receive plasma transfusion, increasing the risk of contracting hepatitis or HIV. The next type is von Willebrand disease. This is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. It is autosomal dominant. So someone who has von Willebrand disease is unable to produce or synthesize the von Willebrand factor. So treatment involves injection of von Willebrand factor or medication to increase its levels. The last type of bleeding disorder is disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. It occurs in two stages. Stage number one. We have a widespread overactive clotting that occurs in intact blood vessels. Therefore, we're going to disrupt blood flow to tissues and organs. The next stage involves severe bleeding. The reason is because we're forming widespread clots in intact blood vessels, which will then use up the clotting factors and as well as the platelets to where now, when we have to form a blood clot, we're unable to. This can occur with septicemia or blood poisoning, 
incompatible blood transfusions, severe immune reactions, such as tissue or organ rejection, can also occur in complications in pregnancy. For example, severe bleeding during or after delivery, as well as certain snake venoms can cause DIC. Treatment will involve platelet or plasma transfusion and clotting factor transfusion.